Well, I don't know if you know this about me or not, but I'm a mom of four, and my oldest son is just celebrated his fifth birthday. And yes, it's very exciting. He's growing up way too fast. Um, but with the first, uh, fifth birthday came the transition to school. And, you know, it breaks your mommy heart a little bit when you have to hand over your sweet child to school for several hours a day. And so on the first day of school, we were taking him to TK, and we were walking up, me, my husband, and actually um, our second oldest daughter was able to join us as well. And so there we were, all were. Of course, I had the baby on my hip, and we got up about, I don't know, probably 10 to 20 feet away from the front door of his classroom. And he suddenly stopped and he froze. And I was kind of walking behind with the baby and I was watching my husband have this whole interaction with our son. And he kind of stopped and froze and Mike, my husband, kind of was ushering him along and he just stood there. And so I watched my husband get down on his level, look him in the eye and say, what's wrong, buddy? And Zach said, I'm nervous, I feel scared. And my husband said, that's okay, but you know what? Daddy's here with you. Hold my hand, and we're going to walk in together. And so Zach said, okay. So he took his daddy's hand. He was one step behind his dad. His dad took the lead and led him into the classroom. And he had a great day, and everything went well. But it took his father getting down on his level and telling him, I'm going to be with you, bud. You don't have to do this alone. And you can trust me that you're going to have a great day at school and that this is going to be okay. And so in taking his dad's hand, following his lead and getting the courage that he needed through his daddy's presence, he was able to walk in and had a great first day. We are going to see something very similar to that in this next passage that we come to in Psalm 23. It's about following our shepherd's lead and taking the courage that we need from knowing he is with us. So open your Bibles with me for this third session. We're going to turn to, obviously, Psalm 23. And you guys know I have loved reading the entire thing with you every time we come together. So if you'd like to recite it with me, great. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're going to pick up at the uh, bottom portion of verse 3, which is where we left off this morning. So verse 3 starts with what we went over this morning, uh, he restores my soul. But the next phrase that's there is, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. And so for point number one on your outline, we're going to put it down like this. Resolutely obey the shepherd. As we seek to follow our shepherd's lead, we need to resolutely obey the shepherd. Now the way that this phrase appears in the original language, which is Hebrew, it says that he leads me in the right path. He leads me in the right way. And from our limited knowledge, like we've been talking about for the last 24 hours, from our limited knowledge, that is something that we associate with a shepherd, right? A shepherd is one who leads, and sheep are those who follow. We saw a little glimpse of it this morning in that video, if you guys remember. Without a shepherd leading, Sheep don't know where to go. You guys remember this morning of the video where the, uh, the portion where there was the car and the sheep were just running around and around and around and around the car like forever and no sheep ever broke off for it and decided to go a different way. They were just following each other over and over and over again, running around in a circle. 
That's what sheep will do. Or they'll walk the same path over and over and over and over again until the shepherd steps in and directs them to a different path, to go a different way. A shepherd must lead and guide his sheep onto the right path. And is this not the same of Jesus with us? For what is his call to any who would be his disciple? Follow me, right? That's how he called his first disciples, follow me. He later told them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The very first step of becoming a shepherd is obedience, is following. But it's not just the first step in becoming a disciple, but rather it's every step after that that is a continual path of obedience, one step at a time, one obedience after another, doing the next thing. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. We don't know the right path to go on. We need to obey the shepherd's leading. We are just like those sheep that without direction, we will keep going down the same path. We will keep running in circles. We need someone to show us the way to go. Obedience will oftentimes require us to deny ourselves. This is why we need to not just obey the shepherd, but resolutely obey the shepherd. We need to be resolved in our obedience because it's going to take us denying our personal preferences, our inclinations, and everything else. We all know so well the words of Psalm 119.105, right? Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. But do you know what the very next verse says? I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. It's not just enough to know what the Bible says, to know that the Bible will illuminate your path and guide you down the right way to go. It takes a resolve like the psalmist, I have sworn an oath and confirmed it. I'm going to do what you say. You must have, we must have, a resolve to obey. That's what it is to be led down the path of righteousness. And it's not just obeying him in drudgery or because I just have to, and oh, I'm giving up all of this stuff in order to follow him. No. The Apostle John said to us, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. It is a joy. It is, should be our delight to resolutely obey the shepherd. We need to be resolved to obey, not feeling burdened by it, but doing so out of a heart that longs to show our love for the shepherd. Anyone that's a parent here knows what a joy it is when your kids obey with the right heart, right? It makes all the difference in the world when your kids obey with a happy heart and a good attitude. And it's often said in our household, you say you love us, then obey us. Show us that you love us by your obedience. Show us that you love and trust us by your obedience. The same is true of us. He leads me in paths of righteousness. You know what the thing about that is, is that a shepherd has to be present in order to lead. A shepherd has to be right there with the sheep. We saw another portion of this on the video this morning. Do you remember where the sheep were kind of up on a hillside and they kind of all ran down to like a bridge and the shepherd was kind of trailing behind them. It looked like maybe he was shouting at them and then they just stopped short and they weren't going over the bridge. What did the shepherd have to do? The shepherd had to come over there, get behind them and show them the way to go. This is the way that you guys need to go. And it took some poking and prodding, did it not, before those sheep finally got moving. 
But again, a shepherd is not far off saying, go over there, sheep, go to that pasture, go that way. A shepherd is right there with the sheep, leading them on the right path, showing them what it is they need to do and guiding them in it. It reminds me of a story I read recently about the Appalachian Trail. I don't know if any of you know very much about the Appalachian Trail, but I read the story and then I got like, I got, went down the rabbit hole <laughs> of learning all about the Appalachian Trail. Um, so if you don't know, the Appalachian Trail is this ginormous trail over on the east, in the east, and it starts in Georgia and it ends in Maine. It spans 14 states and it's 2,190 miles long approximately. Well, this article that I was reading was all about this one particular man who has uh, the distinct honor of having hiked the Appalachian Trail the most times. He's hiked it 18 times. And so it was some kind of remarkable number, like if you totaled up all of the miles that he has hiked, it's 39,000 miles that this man has hiked on foot by doing the Appalachian Trail these 18 times. It takes someone anywhere from five to seven months to hike this trail. If you want to commit to go do this, this isn't just like, oh, I'm going to take a couple weeks off. This is like people saving up their, literally their life savings so that they can go and do this five to seven month long hike. And it doesn't have that great of a success rate. Only one in every four people that start the Appalachian Trail actually finish it. But this man, Warren Doyle, he's so enthusiastic about the trail, and he's so enthusiastic about other people getting to experience it and do it and be successful at it, that he does all kinds of things. He's like devoted his life to the Appalachian Trail. He teaches people classes where he helps them think through all the different scenarios that they're going to be in. He'll give them tips and tricks of what to do. He'll give them little pointers, and he even goes so far as to have led almost half of those times that he has walked this trail himself, hiked this trail himself, almost half of that he's been leading other people to do it. He's led eight groups through this Appalachian Trail, this 2,190-mile walk, five to seven months of time that you're spending with a group of people, and seven of his eight uh, treks that he has taken other people through, through, seven of them had a 100% completion rate. Why? He knows the trail. He knows what it takes. He's walked it. He's done it before. This isn't his first time out there leading people through. He's done it. He knows it. How amazing in it is it that Jesus Christ has done the exact same thing for us as our shepherd? Not only has he given us his word to teach and train and guide us in how we should live our lives, but he actually came down, like we talked about last night, he came down and he lived the perfect life. He walked consistently on the right path. He lived the perfect life of righteousness. The author of Hebrews in uh, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He knows our temptations. He knows our struggles. He knows what it takes to walk in the way of righteousness on the right path 100% of the time. And guess what? With this shepherd as our guide, his sheep have a 100% completion rate. To obey is hard, and that's why we need a predetermined resolve that we are going to follow and obey him, no matter what, if we feel like it or not. 
He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I absolutely love that song that we've been singing, 23. It is great. Shannon, thank you so much for finding that. The band has been leading us these last two days in singing these wonderful words, and I love it because it really captures what this portion of Psalm 23 is saying. The lyrics go, For the sake of your name, make me righteous now. That's the point. To be led on the right path is to obey, and it is to be made righteous, and it is to be made holy by putting our will in submission to him and resolutely obeying our shepherd by following him. This is really the essence of being led on the path of righteousness. Paul spoke to this frequently in the New Testament. We're going to look at two examples of what Paul says it means to walk in a manner that is worthy of his name. So Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, and here's how. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. We walk in righteousness not to make a great name for ourselves, but for his namesake. We walk in obedience because we, don't, we know that his name and his reputation is at stake. He says something very similar in Colossians 1, 10 through 12. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, and here's how, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. We need to be resolved to obediently follow the shepherd in order to follow him in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Let's now look at verse 4. In verse 4, David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Very interesting transition happens here. This whole time, David has been referring to Yahweh in the third person. He leads me. He guides me. He restores my soul. And suddenly here in verse 4, there's a shift. And it becomes David talking directly to the shepherd. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So point number two on your outline, put it down like this. Take courage because your shepherd is with you. Take up courage because the shepherd is with you. David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because the shepherd's with me. Because dad's with me. I don't have anything to fear. If you were to take the valley of the shadow of death and just like very woodenly translate it, it would be translated the valley of the shadowiest of shadows or the valley of darkest, deepest shadows. These are the moments in our life when there is pain, when there is the deepest heartache, when there is deep despair, when everything seems dark. And even in those moments, David says, I will fear no evil because the shepherd is with me. Oftentimes, a shepherd may, lead, may need to lead his sheep through a deep valley or a deep chasm in order to get to green pastures, in order to get to still waters. But a shepherd is never going to lead his sheep through a dark valley for no reason, for no point 
just to walk through it. A shepherd is never going to do that. There's always a point. There's always something on the other side of the valley of the shadowiest of shadows. There's a reason the shepherd is leading his sheep through the darkness. The shepherd knows the paths through the dark valleys are necessary to get the sheep to the place that will ultimately be for the sheep's good. We have an opportunity every spring tea to learn about the life of a woman from church history. And so we've spent the last four years looking at the lives of Elizabeth Elliott, Amy Carmichael, Susie Spurgeon, and Corey Ten Boom. Did these ladies not walk through the shadowiest of shadows? When we think about great heroines of the faith, when we look at lives of saints that spur us on and say, wow, I want to be like them, more often than not, they have walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And that's why their life is such a testimony. Elizabeth Elliot lost her husband, Jim Elliot, to savage barbarians who he was trying to share the gospel with. When Jim Elliot died, they had only been married for 27 months, and their daughter, Valerie, was 10 months old. Amy Carmichael, God called her to be a missionary to India. And Amy Carmichael had to stand on a ship and wave goodbye to her beloved mother, who she describes as being her like, most favorite person in the world, her most intimate of friends. And she had to stand there and wave goodbye to her because she loved God most. Amy Carmichael later wrote in her journals years later that she never recovered from the heartache of waving goodbye to her mother on the dock that day. The pain of the separation was great. Susie Spurgeon, married to the famous great preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon, lost him unexpectedly and at a very young age, I think he was like in his early 50s, when he died. And she then carried on in ministry faithfully. And then, of course, who we just had the opportunity to learn about a few months ago, Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom, in her 50s, was taken to a concentration camp. She was beaten, she was mocked, she was starved. And she watched her beloved sister pass away. God did not walk these women through the valley of the shadow of death for nothing. He did great and mighty things through every single one of their lives when they came out of the valley of the shadow of death and even through the valley of the shadow of death. He was working in them great things. I can't wait to get to heaven and see the kind of mansions that these four broads are set up in, <laughs> right? For It was for their ultimate good, for his great glory. God doesn't waste our pain. We do not have an unkind, unsympathetic, mean shepherd. We have a shepherd who went through such great lengths to stretch out his hands, be nailed to a cross, bled and died on our behalf. And yet we get to the valley of the shadow of death and we want to give up. We think, God, you don't know what you're doing. God, this is too painful. He doesn't waste our pain. Our suffering is never for nothing. And we can take courage that he is with us every step of the way. It's not for nothing that you go through the valleys of the shadowiest of shadows, whatever that may be. And there are some of us in this room here tonight who have gone through significant valleys. But I guarantee that every single one of us could stand up here and attest to the fact that the shepherd has been with us every step of the way. Let's remember that. Let's get courage through that. Our shepherd is with us. 
is with our shepherd too, right? He didn't suffer and die for nothing. Look at what his suffering, look at what his death produced for us, secured our eternal salvation. The heart of our shepherd is to be near to us. God is great. I am small, and yet he cares for me. And the Psalms repeat this over and over and over again. Psalm 34, 18, Yahweh, the Lord, is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. And those of us who have suffered those deep times of loss and pain and sorrow, I know that there are women in this room who have clung to that verse, and we have known and experienced the personal nearness of the God of the universe. Psalm 145, 18, Yahweh is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in spirit and in truth. Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. And of course, the words of Jesus himself, his last words recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, right before he ascended into heaven, He commanded his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Oh, what comfort. Oh, what peace. Oh, what hope. There is in knowing that we can grab the hand of the God of the universe and say, I'm not going to fear because you are with me. Take courage that the shepherd is with you. David goes on to say in Psalm 23 at the bottom of verse 4, he's not going to fear because Yahweh is with him. And then he says this, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So we're going to have a letter A and a letter B under point two. Letter A under point two is gain comfort through his discipline. You can put in parentheses rod. This is speaking about the rod. David says that we can gain comfort through discipline, and here's how. The rod and the staff were the two main tools main things in their tool belt of the ancient shepherd. The rod was a shorter, almost like a club-like wooden stick that the shepherd carried around, and he would use it to whap on the back or on the nose or on the snout a sheep that was getting out of line, a sheep that was being a little too squirrely. Quick little rap would jolt them back into place. Discipline a painful consequence for being squirrely, for not doing what you're supposed to do. Over and over again throughout, especially the Proverbs, we see this great marriage of a father's love and a father's discipline. And who wrote Proverbs? Solomon. And who was Solomon's dad? David, Proverbs 3, 10 through 12, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Discipline and love are tied together tightly in the Bible. Turn with me to Proverbs 13, 24. We'll look at another example of this. Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Love equals discipline, and discipline equals love. Hebrews 12, 7 through 11, 
is where the author of Hebrews expands upon this, actually starts by quoting Proverbs 13, 24, and then goes on to say, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. If you don't get discipline, you're, you're not a son. You don't belong here. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Walking on the path of righteousness. This is why the end of verse 3 and the beginning of verse and, and all of verse 4 are so important to tie together. He leads us in paths of righteousness. And sometimes those paths of righteousness are going to take us into the valley of the shadowiest of shadows. And yet through those times, we can even gain comfort from his discipline, which helps us to stay on that right path. The shepherd's discipline in our lives is not something to recoil from. It's not something to despise. It's not something to reject, certainly. But rather, the shepherd's discipline should be a comfort to us because we see that Yahweh is treating us as his children. For the moms in the room, have you had a child thank you yet for discipline? Anyone? I had my oldest children a few years ago. They uh, came home from school one day and were telling me what in their mind was a horrifying situation that had happened out at the lunch tables. And some kids were acting very disrespectfully, very disobediently, very squirrely. And uh, these kids ended up getting uh, publicly disciplined in front of basically the entire school. And my two girls came home mortified at what had happened. And I will never, ever forget that that day in the car on the way home, I can't remember which one of them said it first, but they both ended up saying it. One of them said, Mommy, thank you for disciplining us so that we are never in that position. We would never do that because you have disciplined us. And then the other one popped in and was like, I don't think those kids have ever had any discipline. <laughs> well, it sounded like they had just gotten it at the lunch tables that day. But they thanked me. They thanked me for their discipline. They saw the path of unrighteousness, and they were able to make the dots and make the connections and say, wow, I have a parent who loves me and who has corrected me and who has helped me restrain my behavior so that I don't end up on that path. We should do the same thing with God. Thank him. Thank you for treating me as your son. Thank you for treating me as your daughter. Thank you for treating me as your sheep to swap me with the rod when I'm getting squirrely, when I'm getting out of line. We should gain comfort through the rod. Next, it's not just the rod, but it's also his staff that comforts us. And so letter B under point two is gain comfort through his spirit, which is the staff. A shepherd used the staff really for two things. A shepherd would use the staff to catch a sheep with that crook on the end, he would kind of use it to hook a sheep and bring it into himself for examining or treatment or whatever it is that needed to be done. He could hook that sheep and bring it into himself. But the second way that a staff was used was not just with the hooked part of, of the staff, but actually with the long stick part. Because if a sheep was starting to wander down the path 
and it was starting to go off the wrong way, then the shepherd could take the staff, hold it out, and kind of gently nudge the sheep back into place, like a little tap movement on a shoulder or on the back. I also read that um, several shepherds used the staff and would just place it on some of their favorite sheep. And their sheep would know, my shepherd is with me. My shepherd is near. Is that not what the Spirit of God does for us? The third member of the Trinity leading us, guiding us, drawing us into the family of God? Let's turn to Psalm 139, 23 through 24. Psalm 139. 23 through 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Asking the shepherd, asking the third member of the Trinity who is present with us to lead us and guide us, to point out anything that is offensive to him in us before we get to discipline. What about John 16, 13 through 14? Jesus said this, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare it to the, declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Spirit takes the Word of God and teaches us and trains us and recalls it to our memory and is like that staff on the shoulder of the sheep, pushing them back in line, pushing them back on the right track. What about Romans 15, 13? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and all peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. all joy, all peace in believing, and that by the power of the Holy Spirit, by that rod just gently placed on your back, knowing that your shepherd is with you, we may abound in hope. Tonight's message is called Following the Shepherd. And as we are resolved to follow the shepherd, we need to be resolved in our obedience to him, And we need to be resolved to take courage in remembering that he is with us, even in our darkest days, even in our most painful moments. He is near to all who call on him. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for these promises that for those of us who have walked through the valley of the shadowiest of shadows. God, we know how true these things are. You have proven yourself faithful in the lives of those people that are recorded in the Bible, in the lives of the people that we see throughout history, and even, God, in the lives of the women in this room here tonight. God, I pray that you would give all of us a steel-like resolve to obey you, to follow you in the path of righteousness, that we would remember that it's not for our glory, but God, it's for your namesake, that your name would be high and lifted up. God, I know that there are hearts in this room who have gone through the deep darkness, And yet, God, you've been there. You've held our hand. You've shown us your nearness. You've brought us your people. You've given us the comfort and the hope and the peace that we need. So, God, the next time that it is that you lead us through the valley of deep darkness, God, may we take courage. May we walk tall, holding our shepherd's hand, knowing You're with us. We have nothing to fear. 
God, thank you for being so abundantly good and kind to us. Please capture our hearts tonight, especially, Lord, as we prepare to have a worship night. God, I pray that all of these truths that we've talked about thus far would come flowing out in praise and adoration and thanksgiving for how great you are. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name, amen.